Of all the scientists who have ever lived, 90% are alive today. We live in a world where the human being, through technology, is the undisputed ruler. But there are darker forces that use this knowledge for evil. Are we headed for extinction, all in the name of science? Not so long ago, this was everyone's nightmare. A nuclear weapon, bombs that could kill millions in a heartbeat. Through this keyhole, scientists have unlocked the world of genes and germs. Now we have the tools to wipe ourselves out with the tiniest army of cells and bacteria. Or perhaps, we'll simply fade away, replaced by our own perversions of science breeds of clones and superhumans. This is the evil side of science. December 15, 1998. Scientists at the Kyugi University Hospital in Seoul, Korea perfect a technique tried only once before. Two years earlier, and after 277 unsuccessful attempts, a British team has beaten the Koreans to create Dolly, the world's first clone sheep. But this team's subject is human. Now, what you're seeing here is the miracle of creation. It's that moment of conception when sperm from the father meets the mother's egg. But in this case, there is no father. The spark of life has come from the nucleus of another cell, like one from a flake of skin. Implanted in the wall of a mother's uterus, the embryo would grow into an exact genetic duplicate of the donor. Perform the same procedure on that baby and then on that baby's baby, and it would now be possible to have three generations in the same nursery, grandmother, mom, and daughter, who are also identical twins. As soon as science got the know-how, the question was, what next? You know, of course, some argue these breakthroughs would only be to enhance life, not harm it. But that's what scientists have said about their discoveries since the dawn of time. And despite their best efforts, they've hardly ever been right. In 1979, scientists in the West were growing increasingly alarmed at the outbreak of anthrax in Sverdlovsk in the Soviet Union. Mostly a disease among cattle and sheep, it causes sores to any part of the skin that comes in contact with it. But breathe it in and the anthrax spores travel through the lungs to the lymph nodes, where they germinate, multiply, and spread throughout the body, releasing toxins everywhere they go. Death comes in days, but a horrible death from hemorrhage, respiratory failure, and toxic shock. Three years later, Soviet President Boris Yeltsin would be forced to admit the outbreak was caused by an accidental release of the spores from a Soviet military facility. Scientists would later confirm a crop duster filled with just 100 kilos of anthrax spores could kill 3 million people in just one deadly delivery. Tighter controls were promised. Once again, no one could anticipate man's capacity for innovation and his appetite for evil. And what if this know-how was to fall into the wrong hands? In March 1995, the dark world of fanatics, psychos, and terrorists pitched to a new low. More than 5,000 people would come coughing and choking from the subways of Tokyo, victims of a deadly gas. Sarah, a deadly nerve gas concocted by the Nazis, had been placed in five subway cars in rush hour and released by maniacs who pierced the parcels with the tips of their umbrellas. A dozen would die. Almost soundlessly, Saren strips the vocal cords of their ability to scream or even cry. 
the world had learned a new lesson. This was the dawn of the era of bioterrorism. Shizuo Matsumoto was born in Kyushu, southern Japan. He became interested in spirituality and tried to join a church that advertised on its own satellite TV station. He didn't make the grade. So Matsumoto invented a religion. The Alm Association of Mountain Wizards was just like Matsumoto's clinics. He sold health drinks and taught yoga and did some publicity photos supposedly showing Matsumoto levitating. He also posed with the Dalai Lama. Memberships and the money rolled in. Matsumoto changed his name to Shoko Asahara, grew his beard and his hair, and he began to think of himself as a god. Of all the religious philosophies Asahara liked, it was the Christian teachings of Armageddon, the end of the world that fascinated him most. The world, he said, would end in 2003. Everyone would die except those who followed him. We have seen this time and time again in Western countries. Jim Jones and the other cult leaders. But no one has ever seen anything like Asahara. He truly believed he is some sort of god. And plenty of other people believed it too. That's the incredible thing. By 1990, Asahara has turned his attentions on Japan's universities, recruiting the country's best but easily led minds, among them astrophysicists and genetic engineers. He put them to work, especially the computer students. They were designing new software. And because they worked for nothing, they slept on bare floors and hardly ate. They could undercut any rival for business. Imagine when some of Japan's biggest companies found out who they had contracted work to. Big companies, even the government. Asahara is good at making money, not just from seizing his followers' property. He sells them bizarre inventions like astral transporters and brainwave hats. By now, though, Asahara is gaining enemies. Oh, he's good at dealing with them, too. Getting out of the cult was far harder than getting in. Those who questioned Asahara's authority would be tortured. But when a 25-year-old former student refused to buckle, Asahara deemed his mind to be fevered. He was dunked in a drum of freezing water. The man quickly went into hypothermic shock and died. A friend who voiced his disapproval to other sect members was strangled. Asahara said he was helping him get to a higher plane. Through it all, Asahara's delusions of grandeur were building. He began a bizarre campaign to run for the upcoming national parliamentary elections with 25 of his devoted followers. Not a single own candidate was elected. By the beginning of 1990, Asahara wanted one thing, revenge. He was ruthless. He would stop at nothing because he believed nothing could stop him. The election reminded him of his childhood when the other children would make fun of him. But because of the people in his group, he had the power to do whatever he wanted. By the early 90s, Shoko Asahara had an army of devoted followers, about a billion dollars, and a maniacal urge to kill. The cult had a chain of successful PC stores and an unlimited reserve of software designers to undercut any tender. Asahara was the world's first dot-com deity, and he was about to order his scientists to work on a new project. Mount Fuji is one of the symbols of Japan. An extinct volcano, it becomes headquarters to Aum's doomsday plans. Using some of the millions they earned from their investments, Asahara built bunkers, 47,000 square feet, with two stories underground where he ordered his brilliant shadow ministry of death to set to work on weapons. He asked for particle beam, or laser. His scientists convinced him biological weapons were cheaper and they could be built now. Getting weapons, guns, and explosives is not easy in Japan. It does not have the violent crimes as the West. But these young scientists could make biological weapons 
from a culture they grew themselves. They could do it in the fish tank. Nothing could stop them. The sect owned an 80-story building on the east side of Tokyo. From here, they'd pump a fog of anthrax through a vent in the building's roof. Victims would die a terrible death, their skin black from blisters, their brains swollen and bleeding, the body blue from lack of oxygen. The fog spewed out for four days, killing pets and plants and causing an epidemic of violent stomach complaints. Asahara ordered his scientists to redouble their efforts. They went to Russia to buy weapons and warheads, to America hunting for expertise. One group was dispatched to Africa where the Ebola virus was spreading. But Asahara's scientists had a new weapon, sarin gas. The Nazis wanted to use sarin and worked on it. It was never used because it wasn't perfected until the end of the war. Its chemical name is isopropanol methylphosphonol fluoride. But all the ingredients were readily available. You could just buy them. But a single drop on the skin was enough to kill an adult. One drop. And one minute later, the nose runs, the chest tightens, there is loss of bladder and bowel control. It is the most horrible death. Asahara and his evil lieutenants built a new factory. This one had just one purpose, the production of sarin. The factory pumped out two tons a day. Asahara ordered the production of 70 tons, enough to kill every living thing on the planet. His doomsday device and Armageddon were within his reach. There were to be two more tests. The first on one of Asahara's religious rivals failed when an alm worker was sprayed by accident. The second was an audacious attack on a group of judges who had ruled against Asahara in a property dispute. Asahara ordered his gas released in the judge's neighborhood. Seven people were killed, 150 hospitalized. The judges lived. A wind shift had saved them. But now Asahara was sure his vengeance could be unleashed. On the morning of March 20th, 1995, members of the Ohm sect left their homes bound for the Japanese subway system. Each will board a different train, all bound for Kasumigaseki, the most crowded point in the city. Witnesses say they dressed normally, no flowing robes, but they did wear sunglasses and surgical masks. Not unusual in Japan. Eight o'clock, peak hour. It was a sunny Monday before the holiday to mark the first day of spring. The trains were less crowded. Later, passengers would recall men fiddling with a foot-long object wrapped in newspaper. As the trains approached the next station, the men punctured their packages with their umbrellas and got off. Their fellow passengers noticed puddles forming as the trains continued. Then, the horror began. The serene fumes spread quickly. Three young women clung to each other, trembling, tears falling from their eyes, but they could not cry. The serene had burned away their voices. Nearby, another woman's contact lenses melted, welded to her eyes. Both would be later surgically removed. There was screaming, the most horrible pain. It was a burning, a terrible burning. There is no worst way to die. Eleven minutes after the strange men had left, the smell was overpowering. Soon, trains and platforms would be littered with the dead and dying. Thousands of others would be dragged to hospitals, still unaware what had crippled them. The method of attack would remain a mystery until the military entered the subway and discovered the packages. Serene nerve gas. A new chapter had been written in the annals of infamy. Now, the world knew what we had been warning for many years. Chemical weapons were cheap, they were easy to make, and they were easy to hide. There was, and still is, no way to stop it. Two days later, the Japanese government launched their counterattack. 2,500 troops were dispatched at Aum Shinrikyo's offices across the country. But it was at the Mount Fuji compound they made their most startling discoveries. Day after day, they emerged with ton after ton of chemicals sodium cyanide, sodium fluoride, phosphorus trichloride, enough to kill between four and 10 million people. 
Asahara disappeared, leaving a collection of Rolls Royces and hotel bills behind him. He sent videos from his secret hideaway telling his followers it was he who had been the target of the gas attack, no doubt engineered by the government of the United States. This was another of Asahara's delusions. He was an accomplished liar, or perhaps he believed it. Who knows? The point is, he could convince anyone. Anyone. At the time of the attack, Alm had an estimated 50,000 members. As late as March 1999, it was still buying up property. Its businesses are still flourishing. Its followers still waiting for the doomsday Asahara predicted. And despite the fact that he's in jail, Asahara is still active on the web, sending his followers this chilling message. My disciples from my past lives who used to live in worldly desires. The time has come when you wake up and hope me. You should never regret at the moment of your death. I am waiting for you to help the salvation activity as my hands, as my legs, or as my head. Now let's do the salvation activity together and let's die without any regret. This was our worst time. Yes, I think this man is evil. He has a special gift, a deadly gift. At the greatest moments in science, skeptics have always got in the way. From Galileo on, there have been naysayers, people who said, what if the world really is flat? Even scientists have wondered whether, if given their time again, they would work so hard to split the atom. Well, now the skeptics are out again. Since the discovery of genetic engineering, the question is, do we really want to mess with the blueprints for life? And will recent setbacks in the cloning of animals, notably the premature death of Dolly the sheep at six and a half years old due to a progressive lung disease, deter scientists from further wading in the waters of manipulating these blueprints. Welcome to Clones Are Us. Every day at Dream Tech International, we make dreams come true. And not just for our clients, but also for those who are rewarded by interacting with someone cloned in our lab. In conventional reproduction, the offspring receives genetic information from two parents. Our way, the offspring receives its genetic information from only one parent. How can our prices be this low? Custom cloning, $8,000. Designer cloning, $5,000. Gene licensing fee, Cindy Crawford or Michael Jordan, for $79,999. Order now and get a backup embryo free. Dream Only this isn't the future. This exists right now on the internet. At the moment, it's a parody site, but ask any scientist in the field of genetic engineering and you'll discover this is not far from tomorrow's reality. So there's really no danger, I think, in that sort of research, and it's of enormous value in understanding disease. If we couldn't do that sort of research on human cells, I think uh, a lot of the opportunities to improve human health and well-being would disappear. The growth of genetic engineering has also led to the growth of a new breed of watchers, bioethicists. The bioethicist is really trying to help inform the conscience of the scientific community and of ordinary individuals in society. For them, the discovery of our genetic blueprint was a signal of the end of the species. People are very concerned about the notion that you may be able to clone an individual and come up with a hundred identical individuals with a hundred identical traits. While the world discovered the me generation, scientists were hard at work finding out exactly what a me is. The basics of genetics were being peeled back like the layers of an onion to reveal the cells and the components within cells until in the 80s, the first proposals to work on human cells were submitted. The Human Genome Project located all 80,000 plus human genes until 1996, when we understood enough to make another life without the need for two parents. 
when you talk about starting to uh, engineer what we call germ cells, sperm and ovum, and then we're into a, a, a different area. We're talking about actually uh, engineering people who are to come into being, and that poses a lot of problems. By the mid-90s, debate on whether to curb research into genetic science was raging. But aided by a mistrust of governments and the growth of the net, people would loathe to have anyone put limits on any intellectual exercise. I think the real problem goes back to this whole idea of essentially cloning a human being, and that at the moment is, as, as I said before, it's really uh, something which is a, a strong prohibition both morally and in fact even legally in, in all countries that I know of that could be capable of doing that sort of research. When genetic engineers learned to grow human ears on the backs of mice, alarm bells started ringing. Suddenly, people could see the Frankenstein implications of what was possible. But what were possible, scientists argued, were cures for cancer, deafness. The lame would walk and the blind could see. If there was a switch in our genetic circuit board that made us or our unborn children sick, what God had turned on, doctors could just as simply switch off. Bring an embryo to into being and then taking its life, which in normal language you'd, you'd call murder, but from a moral point of view, it's the deliberate taking of another human life. Now, anything was possible. There was an explosion of intelligence. Organ transplants would no longer require a donor. They could be grown in the lab. Cloning had opened the door on the possibility of human spare parts. Sounds like we're seeking to create a, a master race. And you have the whole question of who decides, of, of what is the criteria that establishes who is a, a better person. And it, it leads us into the whole area of the dominance of one group over another. In Worcester, Massachusetts, a company created the first viable human bovine embryo, the nucleus of a human cell implanted into a cow's egg. No law existed to stop them implanting it into a woman's body and bringing it to term. Finally, the world screamed, enough. Attempting to clone a human being is unacceptably dangerous to the child and unex morally unacceptable to our society. Bans were placed on experiments into human cloning. By 1997, there were calls to the U.S. Congress to ban cloning absolutely. Most people would agree that that prohibition is, is a, uh, a sensible thing to do until we know more and until some of the moral questions and community issues are worked out. But the laws stipulate techniques that scientists have already outsmarted. It was possible for them to continue their research without breaking the law. I don't know if it's so much a, a question of trying to hold back the tide of science, it's more trying to channel science. It's a question of reminding science that they are truly, the knowledge is to be at the, the service of the human person, that it shouldn't be used to dominate human persons. There's an element of the movement against this that involves people who are, I guess you would have called Luddites, people who really just believe that progress is bad. Um, but as well as that, there are a very much greater group, including people within the scientific and medical fraternity, who just feel we've got to go slowly on these issues and um, that we can't rush into something which may have consequences that we really don't understand. Never before have advances in science moved at such a rapid rate. Our grandfathers were born at a time when the motor car was new. Now. They spend their retirement on the internet studying the likelihood of taking holidays in space. If satellite technology and the media shrunk the world down to a global village, then the internet has brought it even closer. But as fast as the net grows, it can't compete with the real boom business in science, the art of war. Advancements in science to improve the quality of our lives are outpaced only by the advances of an increasingly inventive inventory of weapons in man's hunt for better ways to kill. In the 21st century, the, the main new type of weapon is going to be a sort of weapon which basically delivers energy in any number of ways, whether it be lasers, microwaves, um, information weapons. These things have been 
developing quietly in laboratories you know, over the last sort of three decades or more. Some of them are very well advanced and probably operational. In this demonstration film, the subject is seen standing at a building at a weapons testing facility in France. Suddenly he is convulsed as if in the grip of a brain seizure. Experts say this is exactly the process used in experiments in neurological rays. Concentrated beams of light, microwaves, and ultra-low frequency sound pulses designed to incapacitate the victim. By bathing an individual in a specific um, type of electromagnetic field, you can produce a very wide range of effects from things like electroanesthesia. You can send a person to sleep very easily um, by pulsing the right frequency of energy around their, their body or their brain. Likewise, you can degrade human performance uh, doing such things as making eyesight um, malfunction. You can uh, alter the permeability of the membrane that surrounds the brain and allow specific types of uh, neurotoxins to enter the brain and degrade a person's performance. Researchers tracking the development of new weapons technology have uncovered a range of futuristic devices. Pulses of ultra-low frequency sound as low 1 to 2 hertz, massively amplified and focused, have been used in crowd control. This believed to be experimented somewhere in France. Demonstrators were temporarily disabled with a sound weapon hidden from view. It's um, highly likely now that these types of technologies are not only highly developed, but in many cases uh, operational. Infrasound acoustic beams and high frequency acoustic bullets are being considered to control crowds like this, putting the rioters under maximum control and the police at minimum risk. These types of weapons present a really wide range of challenges for, uh, for society as a whole. Uh, in the hands of terrorists, they're obviously extremely dangerous, as are any uh, powerful weapons. Yeah, you could take a surplus radar transmitter and, and concentrate a beam and just sit out on the street corner and, and blow away virtually any computer facility that, that had no protection. You can create an electromagnetic blast uh, which is totally imperceptible to humans but it'll erase all uh, digital media within a, a range of several hundred yards. War cannot be fought without control of information in the 21st century and this is going to be probably one of the most active areas uh, that all the military uh, establishments around the world will be developing. No longer are lasers strictly the province of science fiction. Since October 1990, the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico has been managed by the U.S. Army Space and Strategic Defense Command. This is the same base for the U.S. military's High Energy Laser Systems Test Facility, or Health Staff. Health Staff is the home of the Mid-Infrared Advanced Chemical Laser, or Miracle, the most powerful laser in the world. These sorts of lasers can be bounced off artificial uh, ionospheric mirrors. For example, you can heat part of the upper atmosphere of the planet and actually shape parts of the atmosphere so that you can bounce electromagnetic signals over very large distances and highly focused signals uh, to target very specific regions of the uh, planet. So the sorts of uh, laser weapons that we'll see uh, appearing on the battlefields of, of the next century or this century uh, won't be anything like Star Wars. They'll be far more advanced than anything you've seen like that. But all of this pales in significance compared with advances in ordinary ordnance. Ever since the six-shooter, armorers have searched for better ways of delivering lethal force. And they have succeeded in ways beyond their wildest dreams. No longer are guns limited to firing bullets. Tasers and other devices can deliver powerful electrical shocks. This is not Star Wars technology. This is used right now on our streets. And weapons are no longer limited to firing shells one at a time. Metal Storm fires dozens of rounds at once. Anyone in the way of the spray is shredded, atomized in a cloud of blood and tissue. All of it the work of a backyard inventor who, just like Oppenheimer and his atomic weapons, is now terrified by the demand for his weapon. The whole promotion of this new uh, array of weapons under the guise of non-lethal weapons is quite a misnomer. Any weapon um, given sufficient power, whether it's a laser weapon, um, a radio frequency weapon, um, microwave guns and so forth, 
with sufficient power you can kill um, the person who's the target. Uh, if you wind the power back, you can uh, promote that weapon under the guise of being non-lethal. But the question of uh, whether non-lethal weapons uh, are actually better is a really interesting one and it's quite a paradox. It's um, because weapons are lethal, it means that the uh, people that use them have to take responsibility for their use. In the story The War of the Worlds, author H.G. Wells imagined the invasion of Earth. Martians had taken over the planet. Nothing on Earth could stop them. And then they began to die. Their downfall? Tiny bacteria, bugs to which humans had built immunity. Other writers, too, have told of the power of germs, viruses, and bacteria. It was in the Bible. The fourth horseman of the apocalypse is pestilence. Each year, it's rare we don't all fall victims to a virus. Tiny organisms, smaller than bacteria, attack the cells of the human body until it can design a defense. The profile of the virus is stored so that, should it return, the body will be ready to repel it. But sometimes, the body simply cannot repel it. In the winter of 1999, Europe was struck by a devastating epidemic. In France, three million were bedridden. Italy, two million. Germany, Denmark and Spain, all over Europe, intensive care wards were filled to capacity, their numbers growing at the rate of a quarter of a million a week. 20,000 would die. Hospitals using refrigerated trucks to act as auxiliary morgues. All of the victims struck with H3N2, the Sydney flu virus, named after the city in which it was discovered. A virulent strain of influenza to which doctors had no answers. There's a very small group of germs that uh, have got multiple resistances that make conventional antibiotics um, uh, a little bit more ineffective in, in treating them. But by comparison, the 99 outbreak was tiny. This one claimed 20,000 lives. In 1918, 40 million died in Spain alone. 280,000 died in Britain, the disease sweeping Europe in less than 12 months. Since then, there have been two more pandemics in 1957 and 1968. No war or famine or natural disaster has killed so many so quickly. The mystery is why these outbreaks come at all and what can be done to stop them. It's almost as if the germs are learning how to defeat our defenses. Sometimes a genetic mutation will um, cause a, a bacteria or germ to, to develop properties that will make it resistant to um, the antibiotics that we've got on hand. Another viral scare gripped the world when six people died from a rare disease believed to have been transmitted for the first time from chickens. In 1997, the Hong Kong chicken flu resulted in the slaughter of millions of birds as the country tried to eradicate the disease before it spread to Hong Kong's enormous, tightly packed population. Ebola sprang from the jungles, dealing its victims an agonizing death. They hemorrhage from every orifice until they pray for a coma rather than a cure. And as man ventures further into this uncharted territory, new species of bats and vermin are discovered. This is AIDS territory a world where we are the invaders and disease rules. Every time there's uh, increased contact with more people, there's increased opportunity for infectious diseases to be spread. Um, perhaps AIDS is the best example of that. But there is hope. Scientists have managed to turn back the clock to the flu epidemic of 1918 to unlock the mysteries of this year's misery. And they came about it by accident and bodies buried in the frozen wastes of Norway. In Spitsbergen, the bodies of coal miners buried alive in 1918 have been perfectly preserved, including frozen examples of the 1918 killer flu. In an incredible stroke of luck, tissue from their brain, kidney, lungs, and spleen were perfectly preserved. 80 years later, modern techniques are being used to examine the viral RNA, and it resembles bird flu not human flu. Still, one in five who catch the flu will die. The reason for that is that 
the flu is a virus and there are a number of um, variants of the virus. The virus, like the bacteria we were talking about, is uh, often undergoing subtle changes and those subtle changes result in, in properties that allow us to identify slightly different strains of the flu. Normally, influenza is confined to cells within the respiratory system, but some viruses have a unique key which unlocks the door to cells throughout the body. A new discovery could allow doctors monitoring flu viruses to spot changes which might give a virus pandemic potential. Chemical warfare is nothing new. It's been recorded as far back as 429 BC when the ancient Spartans lit pots of pitch mixed with sulfur to overwhelm their enemies. And at the time of America's War of Independence, the British were at work in India giving their enemies blankets. But they didn't tell them that they'd been used to wrap corpses riddled with smallpox. Centuries later, the theory is the same. We just got better at the delivery. The Gulf War was the world's last brush with chemical and biological weapons. Though it was never proved, it's believed hundreds of U.S. servicemen left with a debilitating illness called Gulf War Syndrome, or in fact, the victim of some dread new ordinance. History records, though, that the use of gas on the battlefield occurred back in World War I. Mustard gas attacked its victims' throats like the silent killer it was. They were called choking agents. Chemicals like chlorine and phosgene dissolve the lungs, drowning the victim while he stands in the battlefield. They hang low to the ground in depressions and dissipate in the breeze. They were not considered effective. There were others, cyanide that stops oxygen reaching the cells, blister agents like mustard gas that contaminate the field and get in through the skin, and nerve gases like sarin that shut down respiration. As late as the 1970s, the British government admitted that they exposed hundreds of thousands of their citizens to the comparatively harmless E. coli bacteria sprayed from planes off the coast. It was a stunning admission of the development of germ warfare. Anthrax, brucellosis, even the plague has been trialed as a weapon of war. Some of the, uh, the bacteria and toxins that have been developed by military institutions around the world are so powerful that a single release of them into the environment could have um, absolutely devastating effects. The plague that brought death to hundreds of thousands of Europeans naturally could just as easily bring death via a bomb or a missile. Then there are the viruses. 100 times smaller than bacteria, they can infect crops, animals, and humans. And their appearance can be blamed on natural occurrences, shielding the perpetrator's true mission. International conventions prohibit their use, but there are those who believe these weapons have far from disappeared. In fact, they've been refined. We've got um, weapons now that can be uh, ethnically specific in other words, you can spray a population uh, where there's a number of races in a, in a battle area and uh, there are particular agents that will only work on one race of people. Already, arms inspectors have destroyed 38,000 tons of chemical munitions, including 30 chemical warheads for missiles and 4,000 tons of chemical agents. The International Missile Technology Control Regime limits missiles capable of carrying biological or chemical warheads but many countries are not parties to the agreement. There's uh, also the possibility now with uh, the decoding of the human genome where genetically engineered weapons will become uh, so powerful um, that you know, they would have the capacity to wipe out an entire uh, race of individuals, uh, probably in a way that would be very hard to trace. Biological weapons are the ultimate killing machines. They destroy only living organisms leaving buildings, roads, and other infrastructure intact. What's more, they're cheap. And that's what makes them attractive to terrorists. But these uh, chemical weapons are, are so terrifying because they're so hard to control. Their release into the environment um, could have all sorts of unintended consequences. Ask anyone who investigates terrorists for a living, and they'll tell you it's bugs, not bombs, that are the most terrifying weapon on Earth. Like the Omshin Rikyog, sarin gas attack, many experts say it's not a matter of if another terrorist group resorts to germ as well as guerrilla warfare. It's a matter of when. And this reenactment will demonstrate how easy it is to conduct a germ attack, 
We're leaving out key information so that we don't help this information get around. If it was possible, say the experts, to get a hold of a culture infested with anthrax, the disease itself could be cultivated in any pet shop aquarium. And since it's been proven time and again, how just a small amount of chemical weapons can kill millions. Little wonder U.S. leaders have warned the military to be prepared for a major terrorist attack. Of even greater concern is our ability to deal with such an attack. The British Home Office says it is prepared, but making the details public would defeat the purpose of having them. But imagine this. News reports tomorrow tell of an outbreak of disease around your home city. By mid-morning, the disease is spread across the country. Hospitals are at capacity. There are rumors antibiotics are running out. And you notice you have the sniffles and the beginnings of a cold. Does it cross your mind that you and your family have been exposed? I remember one author giving a, an outline of what would be or who would be the perfect human person if we could engineer such. And his conclusion was it was the kind of person who would refuse the project. As the issues are discussed and they become better understood and better known, we'll, we'll be happy to see changes that obviously bring some form of good to people with diseases or whatever. Personally, I suspect that the, the new wave of warfare that we'll see uh, in the 21st century will be largely uh, based on control of the electromagnetic spectrum and uh, information warfare, perception management. In H.G. E. Wells' War of the Worlds, Martians land on Earth. The entire planet is all but wiped out. And then, something miraculous happens. The Martians' greatest machines begin to crash to Earth. The creatures in them fell. They'd caught a bug, a common cold. The smallest organisms on Earth had been the end of the mighty invader. Well's tale could yet come true. As we dominate all before us, there are still mysteries we don't understand. Threats waiting to be disturbed by arrogant invaders. Oh, there's goodness in science. Its application has its evils. The question is that now that we have the know-how, what now? For the Sci-Fi Channel, I'm James Reeves.